This is our last speaker for our 11th year of the Hale Speaker Series. We're so excited to have Carol Tenner here. And thank you all so much for coming tonight. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Carol and how the night goes. Well, first of all, I'm starting two minutes late. That's bad. Uh, we try to start on time. I do a quick introduction, and then Carol will speak, and then there'll be time for question and answer at the end, and then we'll end at 8. So Carol grew up in Annapolis, Maryland, where her love of and fascination with old homes and historic buildings began. She moved to Westfield in 1966 and raised three children here. Um, and her interest in homes and historic homes grew. She became a volunteer docent with Miller Quarry House Museum and later joined the board uh, of the Westfield Historical Society. And then Carol's career in real estate business added to her knowledge of the homes and architecture of the town. And this isn't an advertisement for you, but she helped my family sell my mom and dad's home. And we learned so much about the house uh, because Carol knew all about the builder and everything. So it was really, it was really a joy. Uh, anyway, so Carol Tenner. before. Um, Barb stole a little bit of my thunder because in my first slide, no, that's all right, is how it all started here for me. You know, here we are in a community that was settled in the 1700s, and fortunately we still have a number of these 18th century houses, and my Westfield involvement was with the Miller Quarry House. I was a docent there for 10 years. I was on the initial um, wait a minute, let me... You ready? Can I turn it back on? <laughs> I have to find the right button. Whoops. The down button. There we down? <coughs> okay. All right, there we are. So that's my introduction to the history and houses in Westfield. And those are my two girls. They were also working at the Miller Quarry House on Sundays when I was a docent. And have, not only was I a docent there, but by getting to know my neighbor, Clara Bolger and Betty Pate, and getting involved with them and learning all the history of the town and doing the fundraising and the cherry pie socials to establish the Miller Quarry House as the wonderful living museum it is today. I'm just gonna, just gonna briefly run through some of the old houses, the 18th century houses that are still standing and hopefully you all are aware of some of them. The first one there is the Ripley House. It's over in Elizabeth Avenue. It is still standing, built in 1741. Unfortunately, it was on a big piece of property, as most of the houses were in those days. It has been subdivided, and there are three newer houses in front of it. So it doesn't kind of sit front and center like it used to. The Matthias Sayre House, built in 1763, down at 667 Fourth Avenue. Lots of history there, and you need to hear one of Rob Wendell's historical talks telling all about the history of that house. The Charles Marsh House, built in 1775, now at 500 Salter Place. But when this house was built in 1775, it was located on Benson Place, facing Coolidge. And it was there. <laughs> Or my notes. Um, it was there until 1920, but in the meantime, it was bought, it was part of the Marsh Farm that went all the way to Gallows Hill. And it was bought by Robert Fairbairn in 1888, he established the Fairbairn's Racetrack that was there from 1900 to 1910, running all the way from Salter and Benson Place all the way down to Gallows Hill. And you're going to hear more about Robert Fairburn, who lived up in the historic district on Kimball Avenue. He was a financier out of New York, but he was well known as a horseman. He had two Kentucky Derby winners. And um, you all will recognize his house, the one with the wavy windows, when I get to that. The 
one of the owners, I guess at the time this was being designated as a historic site, was smart enough to subdivide the property once it was located on Salter Place so that there were two buildable lots on either side. The two houses on the side of the slide show those two houses that were built. Unfortunately, they were built to complement this house. They weren't totally out of proportion to you know, distract from the construction of this wonderful house that was built in four sections. This, the first section just went up to that middle chimney there. Then a sec, that was enlarged out to the edge. Then a third section, and then the dormers through the years. And that's still standing and lived in today. A few more houses. Um, 112 Ferris Place, 1750. Hope we can save that house, I'm not sure. But that's actually two houses. The section on the left-hand side was moved from East Broad Street at one point and joined to the smaller house that was sitting on Ferris Place. The next house up at the top, 515 Woodland Avenue, was the first house I was ever in in Westfield. That little house in the center was owned by my realtor, Janet Ritchie. And that was the first house I was in 1966. That was one of my introductions to a house in Westfield. And since then, the house has grown. You can see right underneath it the beautiful addition. And um, it has also been recognized by the Westfield Historic Preservation Committee for their restoration work on that house and the attractive addition to it. But my favorite one on this page is the Scudder House. And that is at 1841 East Broad Street, just past the entrance into Witchwood Road, sitting up there on the hill. The, the um, Scudder family, oh, they were early settlers here. In fact, Scudders owned the house up on Woodland, a different a part of the family. I don't know who, but looking back through the records, Scudders did own the one on Woodland as well. And this one, love this house. It's, it's got a little more of the influence maybe from England that was coming over at that point, a little more refined on the inside with beautiful details around the mantel and corner cupboards. And um, fortunately, for quite a while there, when it was designated as a historic house, this historic property, the Malcolms lived there, and they did a wonderful job of kind of bringing that house back to life. Then it kind of, somebody else moved in and maybe didn't do as much, and then somebody else moved back in and started kind of bringing it back to life again. Then, on to the next section, section of the development of the town, and that was 1794 to 1864. There wasn't a whole lot of growth in in Westfield as far as building houses during that time. It was very much a farming community and the train came in about 1936 uh, but it was just from Elizabethtown to Somerville and you had to go to Elizabeth to transfer into train to New York. So we were still kind of a sleepy little farming community at that point. And then when the train did come to town when they built the trestle over Newark Bay or whatever it was, and you, we had direct train service to New York. The property owners and the people in Westfield started really promoting Westfield as the place for people to get out of the city and come build their beautiful homes. But during that period, there was one wonderful house that was built, and that was this house, the Leverage Harrison House built sometime between 1861 and 1863. It is a huge house. It's one of the biggest houses at the time, an Italianate cube type house with 12 foot ceilings on the first floor, 10 foot ceilings on the second floor, a full third floor, and a fourth floor. The fourth floor, you can't even realize it there. There are dormers out the back, but literally it's like a walk up. It's like a third floor in a lot of the houses today. This house was originally on Harrison, on East Broad Street, right at where Harrison Avenue starts today, on a lot of acreage. In fact, um, the Leverage family owned land that was owned by, they don't know whether it was father and son or father and 
bro you know, two brothers or who, but two Ledridges owned the property, and it went all the way over to the Reeve House property. So it went over part of Clark Park, up to Kimball Avenue, so it was, it was huge. And then another family bought it after that, and then it was sold to the Harrison family. And the Harrison's son kind of saw what was coming in Westfield, saw it was going to be, kind of anticipated a boom in the community. So he went into partnership with his mother who owned the house and they started selling off the lots and dividing that area and established Harrison Avenue. And a lot of the houses standing today on Harrison Avenue are the original um, Sears and Roebuck houses. But this house was moved twice. It was moved, you know, as they were developing Harrison Avenue, it was moved a couple of doors up off East Broad. And as they extended the street down, and then it had its prime big lot location down at the end of Maple Street. And the Harrisons, there were five Harrison kids, and by 1966, there were three of the Harrison sisters living in that house when Marion and Jack Carter bought that house. And one of the sisters lived in a house across the street. And those three, two of the sisters moved in with her, so they were still in the neighborhood. Maybe one had passed away at that time. And when the Carters bought the house, they subdivided the property. They um, brought Maple Street across Harrison Avenue, and so now it ends down in a little cul-de-sac there, and a couple of new houses yeah. were built. Love this painting. Watercolor by John Brenner, the Brenner family. It's been around here for, it seems like hundreds of years. Um, 1965 shows you the train coming into town. That is probably Central Avenue with the horse-drawn cart going up the road. You can see the Presbyterian Church, and can you, I don't know, does it show well enough? Can you see the Mindewaskin? I can on my slide, I don't know whether it re reproduced that well that big. <coughs> But that was kind of beginning of the boom in Westfield, of uh, it becoming a New York commuter executive community. So we became a village in transition from 1864 to 1980 to 1903. 64 was the completion of the Jersey Central Trestle over Newark Bay. 1865, the population was 1682, and it had more than doubled by 1900. The population was 4329 in 1900. 92, the, elect, the electric service was provided. So you think of those other houses, didn't have electric service, didn't have public water, didn't have a sewer system until the end of the 1800s. This picture, one of my friends whose husband was very involved in getting the Kimball Avenue um, district preserved or becoming a historic district and had done so much um, research over there gave me this wonderful little book on Westfield, Sketches of Westfield. And it was from 1893. And I took those sketches and with the help of, help of Stan Lipson down at the archives, he helped me identify the houses that were still standing, and I went around and I took pictures of them to see how they look today, all these years later. And this picture is at the corner of Ross looking down Boulevard. I just took the other picture 125 years later, and the only thing that's changed is the second house in was torn down, and that's a two-family there. But all the rest of the houses, all the way down from Ross to Park are still standing. And if you if you want to trace Westfield's arch uh, um, architecture through the years, just drive down the boulevard. It all kind of starts there. The 400 block, you know, that started being built in the mid 1800s as the train came to town and the commuters <laughs> wanted to be able to walk to town. Then you get down, this is the 500 block, that was late 1800s, then you get into the 600 block, and it's 18, late 1800s, early 1900s, mid 1900s, going all the way out. You can just really trace the architectural history of Westfield and the growth of the community just driving out the boulevard. 
<coughs> Here are some of those houses. 515 Boulevard, the first one. That was owned by the Sargent family, and Mr. Sargent was the founder of Ingersoll Rand. Could I suggest you put the microphone on the other side? So oh, I'm sorry. I walked away from it. That was the Sargent's house, and he was the founder of Ingersoll Rand. <coughs> There it is before, and those of you, and there's some of our grant school people here, I recognize out there. The, the Brawns owned that house, and Jenny Braun was our costume maker for the grant school show. So I was in that house many times through the years. Then the first two houses on the boulevard, and then I added the Arib House, the home of the Westfield Historical Society, because that was also a sketch from this book of 1903. <coughs> Here are a couple of other boulevard houses that I personally found kind of interesting. 527 Boulevard, built in 1900. In 1986, the family living there, the Benares family, in his retirement, Chris decided he was going to restore this house. And he had been a carpenter in his early, early years. And he had a love of carpentry and had quite a workshop in the basement. And he made all those balustrades, spindles, all the details on this house. In the basement of this house, he entered it in Better Homes and Gardens competition. There were 7,000 applicants, or, and he won first place wow. for a project of that size. And he, they went down to Cape May and walked all around Cape May to pick the colors. And they got many compliments on the colors, but the day the house is pink. So that's the house. Yes, that's right. <laughs> 614 Boulevard, built in 1910. I actually, in about 2005, I had clients who desperately wanted to buy that house. They really wanted a project wanted an old house, they loved this house, but unfortunately it was more than needing a new kitchen and new bathrooms. It, it was the underpinnings, it really needed major and it was just not in their price range. So they had to back out. And the next couple that came along went through the same thing. So the house went down, but that's a new house sitting there which certainly, certainly complements the neighborhood. So it's so nice to see people being sensitive to the style and the periods of the neighborhood. Now most of you probably know this house, 1890 Colonial Revival. This was the home of Charles N. Cotting and he was quite a very important person in that time in Westfield. He was an attorney, he was a congressman, he was he entertained, I, Teddy Roosevelt was there, Amelia Earhart, um, William Taft. I mean, it was just evidently the gathering place. That, um, that was definitely a meeting place in Westfield. And evidently, I, there's a, a den in that house or a study that was brought over from an abbey in England, a beautiful spiral staircase. And the Cotting family owned it until 1946. And Mr. Cotting died in, I think it's around 1926. And going through the archives, I found this letter that was written by an Ann Maxwell. I don't know if anybody here ever knew Ann Maxwell, who lived in Stonely Park. <coughs> and she had read in the Westfield Leader that they were discussing, no, the Squires bought it in 46. This was in. 86, when this letter was written, that she had read in the Westfield Leader that they were considering taking this house down. She was very upset about it because she had grown up in this house. She was Anne Maxwell. Her mother was the Cotting's daughter. And when Mr. Cotting died in 26, her family moved into this house to take care of her grandmother. So she really lived there all her life. And then she's living down. She was in North Carolina. And I actually wished I had a phone number so I could have called her and asked her questions. So 
when it, this was after the Squires had moved out, and when I came to town, I heard all about the Squires. This was the bachelor residence. I heard there were pool tables yes. in every room, and you know all these wonderful stories. And then, fortunately, in 1992, a young couple bought the house and had restored it, and it's a wonderful, wonderful home again. Recognize this? Westfield Family Practice, but this was the runner's home. And the center section was the original piece, and that was built in 1872, Second Empire. And the property was 150 feet wide, and it went all the way back to Summit Avenue. And the runners wanted to add on to the house, so they bought 50 more feet. So they had a huge lot. And they were in it, this is when I need my notes. <laughs> I can tell, I don't. Wait a minute. Okay. Tell the family, the son sold it in 1920 and subdivided the lot. Sold off the lots around it, but the building remained, and I couldn't find the years, but I did find that some sometime. At one point, it was going to be taken down, and a resident of the Summit Avenue area bought the house to save it and developed the houses around it. So there's another old house that was saved. So you've got the squires that was saved, this one was saved, and we'll see more that, that were saved during this. The Florence Horn Van Dellen House. Now this one probably doesn't mean anything to anybody but me, but I think it's got really a, a nice story, unless there are people here that are on the Westfield Foundation and have heard the name. But I was fortunate enough to be called by the attorney for Florence's estate when she passed away in 2002 to list the house. It was a two-family. It's in that first block on Summit Avenue up from the train station. I went in it, it was like time had stood still since the 1920s. I mean, very minimal updating. The kitchen sinks hung off the kitchen wall wall with a like a curtain around the bottom of it. I mean, it was not. I mean, she lived very, very, very modestly. And I got to know her nephew. She never had any children. And I got to know her nephew who told me her story, that she graduated from Douglas College in 1920 and began teaching school in Westfield in 1930. And she taught English at Roosevelt and Edison her entire career. And she was a tenant in this house. And in 1946, so from 1930 to 1946, she was a tenant. And in 1946, her landlord passed away. So he lived on one floor, she lived on the other. And evidently, he was very fond of Florence. And when he died, his will provided for Florence to own the house at a very reasonable price. So it became Florence's house. She did have a boyfriend during these days, but he was in the army down at Fort Dix. And 10 years later, when he retired, he came back to Westfield. And he was very involved in volunteer work and everything in town. And he predeceased Florence. And when I listed the house, I just saw it being restored to a single family house. I mean, it just had all these wonderful elements. I knew where the walls had been put up. So I listed it as a two family and a single family. And I had all these investors in town, you know, coming into my office with their spreadsheets that I had priced it wrong, that there's no way they could make any money on it at the price I had it listed at. And I, I kind of sat there and never done anything like this before. But, kind of a situation, I said, well, maybe you aren't the right buyer for it, knowing that I had a couple of young couples just dying to buy the house. Got into a bidding war, sold over asking, and this young couple from Jersey City moved in there and restored it to a single family house. So that was a wonderful story, but the story got even better when I got my um, Westfield Foundation newsletter announcing the Clarence and Florence Horn Van Dellen Scholarship. Living very modestly, she left a half a million dollars to the Westfield Foundation to establish a scholarship that's given out every year to students from Westfield that have her scholarly and citizenship and in need. 
of money so they could go to college. So I thought that was kind of a neat. Nice. All right. One person in this room I can't answer, but answer this. Um, <laughs> this house was the first house built in what is referred to as Dudley Park. And the only reason I know I found this house in the archives because I was reading the history of Dudley Park and I found which was the first house built there and a description of it. And it's like, hmm, that's not how it looks today. So with the help of people down at the archives and going through a lot of books down there, we found this picture. But Dudley Park, the property going from at least Highland Avenue, because that was called Park at the time, all the way probably over to Elm Street. Uh, was purchased by John and Helen Dudley. They purchased 70 acres for four thousand, just under four thousand dollars, <laughs> between <laughs> between 1960, I mean 1864 and 1866. The train had come to town. They kind of saw it coming. They just felt they were going to develop this into beautiful estate homes in this area. Uh, they they advertised madly, and it was all about the transportation and these luxury coaches taking, taking them to New York. And this house, I'm going to go show you what it looks like today, then you'll recognize it. But when I was reading about the people who owned it and the additions and, that were made through the years, and it said this house, some owners in the 1930s took off the front porch and put columns on it, and I'm thinking, well, what did it look like? So there's the house. Wow. So I'm sure you all wow. know this house today. So um, the second owners added the tower, and he made stained glass. So he's responsible for all the beautiful stained glass windows in this house. And I guess he must have. Uh, did he have? I mean, he must have added the columns too. I don't know. That was the board. Was that the Gordons? Who, no, the Gordons. Yeah, the Gordons. Excuse me. Yeah, it's the Gordons who took off the porch and added the columns. <coughs> and now the column, these new owners from two years ago, I think they've been in their house <coughs> two years, have lowered the columns, but the other detail still remains. It's a it's a beautiful, beautiful house, and it's just gotten more beautiful every year. Everybody's moved in there and added their touch, and it's just one of the jewels of Westfield. Here's the second house built in Dudley Park. And you probably recognize this one. It's on the corner of Lawrence and Dudley. It is the Bridges. This was the Bridges house. The Bridges built this house in 1876. And Mr. Bridges made his money. He um, invented the coupling system for the railroad. <laughs> and he had two daughters, and one of them was very important in Westfield. She was very civic-minded, and she basically, she was pretty important in founding the library, the Congregational Church, and what is now the Children's Specialized <coughs> Hospital. She was the first president of the Women's <coughs> Club. <coughs> and the family donated the first public park in Westfield, and that's the Triangle. As Lawrence and Mountain Avenue, that was that was donated by the Bridges family, and Emma Bridges also was quite an investor in real estate. She owned the the um, Bridges cottages. She owned quite a bit of real estate. She owned two of the houses in the historic district on Kimball, and other houses elsewhere. But I, I know of the two on Kimball. The house at that point was owned by. Um, Dr. Lindenberg and his family, and when they went to sell it, the house looked like the picture up here in the left-hand corner with no porches on it. But in the house, he had framed the original architectural drawings of the house, and you could see these porches. And the next family moving in there restored those por porches, 
as per the original architectural drawing. So that's how the house looks today, and it's probably how it looked back when it was born, born, built <laughs> in 17, 1876. Going out of Dudley Park a little, but trying to keep in the time frame of the building of the houses is the French Keeler House. I'm sure you all recognize this one. Uh, sitting at 120 West Dudley Avenue, but that's not where that house began. That house began on the corner of Prospect and Dudley, but looking at Prospect. And it was just what they call a planned house, and it was just this little box. It wasn't the fancy Victorian it is today, and it was owned by the French family. And Mr. Keeler came to town, and he bought it, and he decided he wanted more property, so he bought, the French has owned a lot of the property across the street on Dudley. So he had the house moved. And my notes, see I'm not following my notes. <laughs> I have to tell you, I know what year it was. It was moved. Maybe I don't. Uh, but anyway, the story of it being moved by two sturdy oxen <laughs> pulled by a winch that was it had breeze logs and they put this house on it and they moved it a half a block down on Dudley and it took them all summer <laughs> so when you think of moving these old houses but this one so then he loved it with all the property around it, and then it was all the French property there, and he had bought some of that, quite a few acres of that. And then he's the one who added all the fanciful, all the um, Italian, Italianate Victorian details on it, especially that gable up there at the top and the porches around it. It was a very simple, simple house when he moved it, and that's what it looks like today. And for now it has landscaping. For many years, it was in the Keeler family until just a few years ago. And that's what I found about so many of these houses. They were just passed down from generation to generation to generation, which was great because they were families who really loved and had an emotional tie to the house and wanted to keep them wonderful and take care of them. So they had the first non-Keeler family living in this house since it was built in just the past few years. French house. <laughs> on Clark Street. This was built in 1881, but the picture at the lower left-hand corner shows the French house in 1814. And the French family owned the property from Wrightwood Avenue to Dudley, from Clark to Prospect. That was the French farm. And then as they sold that off, the property was subdivided. And this house um, is still pretty much, it's had additions put on it, but very nice additions on it. The basement is still a little scary. <laughs> it is still the dirt floor. Basement, I was a little, little disappointed when I went in at this time when it came on the market to see the, the owners had gotten rid of all the beautiful pine, wide plank, pumpkin floors, pumpkin pine floors, and put in new hardwood floors, but they still love the house and we're taking good care of it. I'm sure you all know this house. This house has a very interesting history. 730 Lawrence Avenue. This is just my interest in taking pictures of houses that I happened to be driving down Lawrence Avenue and took these two pictures up the top during the reconstruction and the addition. So I pulled over and took the picture of one where they had just framed it and the next one when they were kind of playing with paint colors. And then below that is how it looks today. But this house was originally built on the corner of Lawrence and Dudley. In 1886, it was built on that corner. In 1906, the Collins family came to town, and he was an importer of rare woods. And he had a vision of what he wanted to build in Westfield. And it was kind of a mini vision of Stanford White's Monticello, up, <laughs> Montebello, up in Suffern, New York. So he wanted to build that type of house. And there wasn't, Lawrence Avenue wasn't developed. This land, though, was owned by 
the Tubby family, the one up on, on Lawrence, and he looked all around for a lot to build this his dream house on, and he didn't see anything he liked, so he decided to buy the property on the corner of Lawrence and Dudley, where this house was located, and move this house up Lawrence Avenue so he could build his house on Dudley. And this is the house he built. <laughs> and it, it does have kind of the same roof lines as um, the Stanford White House, but not quite as grand at all. And I, talking to Greg Blossie, the architect here in town, he has been in the house. People have been there for, oh, maybe 15, 20 years now. And I asked him, I said, is it still all the dark mahogany walls? I mean, it's just beautiful, but I find today everybody wants to make light and bright. And he said, yes, that it is. It's just, they have kept it. It's just exquisite woodwork, beautifully done. And also a special note on this house are these medallions. On either side, have you ever noticed them when you've driven by? They came from the Mercer factory down in Doylestown, and Mercer was very important in the arts and crafts movement, and his tiles are, oh, oh, in Rockefeller's house, and um, Rutgers College, and different important buildings, and, and um, the Cushmans, who owned the house for many years, when I had the pleasure of getting to know them and listing the house and learn the history directly from Mrs. Cushman, who was a writer and a consultant herself, so she had tons of information on the house and had loved it and was able to share all the information of it with me. But they went down to the foundry and had them make tiles that are on the back of the house that represent the Four Seasons. <coughs> Another house in Dudley Park on East Dudley Avenue. This is wonderful. The house. Up here is what it looked like when it was built, and through the years, porches are a big thing, but it's just gotten grander and more wonderful through the years. So it just shows the, the progression, and you'll find that a lot of people, some of the porches have disappeared, but a lot of people have added porches, and some have added porches on houses that never had porches. <laughs> porches are, if it kept the house going, that was fine. Um, now we're in the Kimball Avenue Historic District which is also part of Dudley Park. And this is just a real treasure of wonderful shingle style. Hmm? She said there's my house. <laughs> I was talking about Robert Fairburn, and that's his house in the center, but this is the first house that he owned when he was building that one, and then his mother lived in the one next door. So that's why I kind of featured these six, the, every single house on that part of the historic district are absolutely beautiful. And I'm not going to go into all the architectural detail of them because Greg Blossy, next Tuesday, the 17th, or the 17th, what night that is, at the um, community room, will be doing a whole talk on the houses, all these shingle houses in the Kimball Avenue historic district. However, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this one, the Dorman Ludwig House, because I know it rather intimately. Um, the present owners moved in there in the early 80s and just had a, just really had a love of wanting to restore a Victorian house. This is basically a shingle, shingle house. And oh my gosh, the research that Pat did was just amazing. You know, I've read all his papers and all he did to research this house and such a love of wanting to restore it to what it was like when it was built in 1897. And when he bought it, it had red brick stairs coming down the front. It didn't have the railing up in the top. And he put the wood stairs back. He had the, the railing built. He matched the railing around the the property, it had an asphalt shingle roof. The original house had a wood shingle roof, so he put a wood shingle roof on it. And the house, the main, the original part of the house is in absolutely perfect condition, but brought up to today's standards as far as the air conditioning, the heating, and the insulation. 
and then across the back they did a big family room kitchen addition but they used the windows or all the original windows from the house they just moved the wall back and the windows they didn't come in and put in new windows they moved the radiators they kept everything they could and the the beams in the family room there were copied identically they had a master craftsman go in and copy the beams from the ones in the entry parlor of the house and it's just it's a it's just a gem of a house and it's so so beautifully done it's like a new it's better than a new house where is it located that's 242 kimball avenue it's right across the street from the ones in the previous slide Terrace Park. I've lived in the neighborhood for, all, for over 50 years, and I didn't know until a few years ago that it was Terrace Park. <laughs> but in 1903, a man by the name of Charles Ditz bought what was the Mills Tract and laid out the streets, and that was the 500 and 600 block of Tremont and South Euclid. He did not finish the project, but he built the first house, which is the one up there in the right-hand corner, which sits on the corner of Euclid and South Euclid and Tremont, which was purchased a couple of years ago and has been beautifully and painstakingly restored by the present owner who kind of when you hear a rock star bought the house, you don't think they're going to go in there and restore it, and they did. I mean, they just, it's just phenomenal what they've done, but there's a picture. The house that up here in the right-hand corner is the one in the middle of that picture. <coughs> and over here, and Mr. Randolph then bought all the available lots and guided the development of what he called our Terrace Park. This was the first of two sections that would greatly determine Westfield's character and look as an upper middle class colonial revival residential town. So he went from here to the gardens. So this was his first project, Terrace Park, and from here he went over and developed the gardens. And I love this picture of Mr. Randolph down here in front of his office. So back in 1903, what was, has been the Rorden Building and the Flatiron Building for many, many years was a real estate office also back in 1903. Some other significant homes in that neighborhood. 561 Tremont Avenue. This was one of the first houses built over there. It was designed by Stanford White's office of McKean, Mead and White. And it won first place award for Center Hall Colonials two years in a row at the Grand Central Palace in New York City. <laughs> so that has a, it's, it's really a, a beautiful house and it hasn't changed much through the years other than being updated with kitchens and bathrooms and stuff. It hasn't been added on to. It's pretty much, pretty much the way it was built. And at one point it was owned by the Foster family and Larry was the vice president of public relations for J&J, &J, and he was kind of the face in the nation during the Tylenol scandal. He was, he was the one that became the example of other companies to follow when you have something happen, like the Tylenol thing. And so he, he's also a writer, so he had a lot of fun researching this house and finding out all the history of it. Another very special house, this is this house, which I'm sure you all probably recognize at 534 Tremont Avenue. And what makes this house very interesting, not only is it a very beautiful house, but it has two twins. Another one in Westfield and the Fort Knightley Club in Summit. They were built, the architect was Alfred J. Norris of Montclair in New York. Uh, 534 Tremont and the Fort Knightley Club are really more similar than Stonely Park as far as exterior, you know, the details in the exterior. The details in the exterior of the Fort Knightley Club, which is also known as the Maples, and 534 Tremont is much more detailed, um, palladium windows, bevel glass windows. This one's much more simple, but I've been in, I haven't been in the Fort Knightley Club, but I've been in two Stonely Park and 534 Tremont, and the floor plans are absolutely identical in both houses and the present owner of 534 Tremont 
has been in the Fort Knightley Club, and he tells me that's identical. And I do know that, that the architect is the same for both houses. And when 534 Tremont was built, the driveway came in from the back, from Fairmont. So the garage was a carriage house in the back of the property. And so the driveway came in there. So I kind of find myself wondering if it ever had a wing on it. These two houses have a complementary wing on the other side, and you wonder whether this one ever did, whether they had to get rid of it to put the driveway up there. That I don't know. Another anchor of that of Terrace Park is the Women's Club. Colonial Revival, built in 1909. It was referred to as the Little White House. Um, one of the reasons it was given that name, the Toll family, there were two mayors in that family. Father and son were both mayors of Westfield. Across the street was a mayor, too, living in the big stucco house across the street. Uh, it was the Women's Club from, what, 1935, 1955 to 1999. It was a wonderful meeting place, but I think the Women's Club felt they were spending all the money kind of trying to take care of an old house instead of being able to give scholarships. So they did sell the house and a nice family moved in there and have been restoring it and working on it ever since. Then we have a great American Home Award winner on South Euclid. That's the home of Barry and Jenny Jaroselski. They bought this house in 2001. Almost in original condition, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great house and great bones and they had great vision. And they didn't know it, but I took that picture up and I was down walking around the property and looking at their addition and I was so fascinated of how they had replicated the gamble roof from the side of the house to the back of the house. So I took that picture and that was the same picture that was used in um, all finished in submitting this for the Great American Home Award, which it did win. So I'm very proud of them. They did a great job restoring this house and yet keeping all the many of the original features and character of the house, windows. I think at one point Jenny said that the, the architect said it would be cheaper to have put new in, right Jenny? Barbara said that to me that, oh yeah, I didn't know that was an option to tear it down and replicate it from <laughs> <laughs> It's a beautiful house. It was owned by the Lee family of the Westfield Leader, the publishing family. The Wallace House at 629 Tremont. Beautiful Georgian colonial, 18 inch thick brick walls. I have a brick house in lines of brick veneer on a wood frame house. This is a solid brick house. It's a beautifully built house, but what's there's very special about the family that lived there. Charles Wallace, with his friends, friend Mr. Tiernan, farmed, formed Wallace and Tiernan Pharmaceuticals back in 1911. And in 1913, he invented the chlorination system. So he, at that time, 30,000 people a year were dying of typhoid, and within a decade, that number was reduced like 93%. And his first customer was the Newark Water Supply Company that um, bought into his system of chlorinating water. They're also the benefactors of the Wallace Pool at the Y, Camp Elgebar, the Y Camp is named after their three daughters, Elizabeth, Barbara, and Jane. They, that grand hall, it was like if there was any young gal in town, I mean, Mrs. Wallace was very involved with the Y and making sure kids had a place to go after school. The basement had ping pong, pool tables, a refrigerator full of food. There's a gal in my, in my office who was one of the kids that used to hang out at the Wallace house after school. But then, as the, Mr. Wallace died in the 60s, and Mrs. Wallace died in 92, but in those later years, she was not well, and they had to lock up the basement because the kids were abusing it. She wasn't young and able to kind of watch over it. 
what is now the Westfield Foundation was originally the Wallace Foundation. Mm -hmm. So they, um, many brides came down that staircase. That was just a very welcoming home. Then when the Oak Houses bought it, they put the big addition on the back and they got an award from the Historic Preservation Commission, a Devlin Award for their nice addition in keeping with the house. What they also did was put in, they had triplet boys who were outstanding soccer players, so that field there is an AstroTurf soccer field. <laughs> which the new owners use as a putting green. <laughs> so. Now we're over in the gardens. This is where Randolph went after he completed the Terrace Park area. And this is what ranked him as one of Westfield's great developers. That's a beautiful area along with Arthur Rule and Lee Parasol and others. And this house is the first house on, the, on um, Highland Avenue. And I always wondered why it sat sideways. That this was on the side of the house where you see those stone pillars. And it's just recently sold and they've been added on to through the years, but the house, the picture that I was familiar with was the one in the center, because that had been kind of on and off the market through the years, and during the height of the market, it sold for a whole lot of money. I mean, it was this tiny little farmhouse, and that market was just so hot at that time, I think it sold for over 900,000, and then when the market started to dip, the, couldn't sell it anywhere close to that, it went into a bank sale, and the people who restored it and added the addition to it bought it at that time. But finding an old picture of it, the one here on the left, when I, when I used to see it from Highland Avenue, I had no idea that on the back side of the house it looked exactly like the front side of the house. So then you realize that the road used to come in off Dudley. So it was a long driveway. So that was the front of the house when that was built. So in 1860, the driveway came all the way in off of Dudley. Two more houses in the gardens that I thought you might recognize, the Spanish Mission style, which has just been purchased in the past couple of years, and it's, it's a beautiful house, and it's just kind of been brought back to its glory, and there it is, and it's kind of fun to see the old <coughs> pictures and compare it with how it looks today. And then over on the right, 527 Highland Avenue, built in 1917, it's one of the early houses over in the gardens, and why I have the sketch of it up above um, from our salt box to split level guide to the architectural history of Westfield, they, they use it as an, as an example of a very fine Dutch colonial with a gamble roof. And what's wonderful to see is when people do add additions that they do them in keeping with the original architectural style. And you can't see the roof on the other end, but they took that porch on the right hand of the side of the house and put a big family room on it and did replicate the same Dutch gambrel roof. <coughs> on the edge of the gardens, you're all familiar with this house? Mm -hmm. But I thought you might like to know that this is what it looked like <laughs> before <laughs> they restored it. Uh, but yes. you can go in the house and I can feel that old house. I, that was my listing in 1987. It was a stucco house and then when I saw this one, but I can identify some of the roof lines, the same chimneys there, and when I went in the house, the same staircase, and some of the same things, but you'd never know it from looking at the outside of it. 1904 to 1945, this is when we really became the booming suburbs. It had kind of been started by Dudley Park, by the gardens, by um, Terrace Park, but now we have a planned community, and it is Historic. It's part of the, what is it? What do you call it? The National Register. National, National Register. Time for me to refer to my notes. It's on the National Register. And it was, it started by a Mr. Tremaine, who was president of Aeolian Company, who made pianos and organs, and he bought a beautiful, very elaborate, old shingle-style house that was sitting on um, Dorian Road 
where the Williamsburg apart, um, townhouses are now. That's where his house was. It's no longer there. And his cousin, another Tremaine, bought this house up on the corner, or built this house on the corner of Dorian Road. And that was at one point one Stonely Park. And they just loved it. I mean, they, they were moving out to this wonderful suburb of nice properties and kind of a country feel. And then what is now Stonely Park was the Drake property, and it went on the market for sale. And they started hearing rumors that they were going to be uh, builders were coming in and were going to subdivide them into little 50 foot wide lots and maybe some apartment buildings. And this is not what they envisioned at all for coming to Westfield and being able to walk to the train. They wanted this quiet little country setting. So they decided to buy the land. So they bought all this straight property and they developed Stonely Park and they created a a park-like setting, so it's not all flat in there. You know, the center section is kind of up on the hill. They have deed restrictions, <laughs> which is, I don't know whether they get away with today, but no fences that can be seen from the street, not even any shrubbery lines that can be seen from the street to do for any demarcation of the properties. They wanted to just be able to see the, see the lawns going from, you know, one lawn to another. And it was developed in three different phases. There was the early phase, which were the houses that were built in the 19, early 1900s to about 1920. Then the next phase was the 1920s to the 1930s. And then the last phase, they were, they were 10, they're 20, they're 30 houses on 20 acres, yeah. 30 houses, 29 of them are in Stonely Park. Number 30 is the one on the corner of Dudley and Westfield Avenue. So 10 of them were built before 1920. Another 14 were built in the next era, the 1930s to the 1940s. And then there were six built after that. There are some more of the houses. They were mostly colonial revival, but during this period they did sneak in a uh, Spanish and an Italian and a Tudor, so there, there's, but most of the houses are your very traditional colonial revivals. Which wood? I have to refer to my notes now, sorry. <laughs> I can run out of steam here. How many are my notes? You're just about there. Close this time to quit. <laughs> Make this quick. Uh, sorry, I knew I was going to get here and get to the point where. Uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. Okay. Are the rule all these years of living in Westfield? I was pretty aware. I knew some of the history of Witchwood, but. I didn't, I thought it was a community that was kind of developed in the 30s, maybe around Bristol Hill and the Bristol Myers houses. And I didn't realize it was part of Arthur Rule's dream to, commute, to create this community that had a little bit of everything. Houses of all sizes and shapes and really being a, a real representative of telling a story of American architecture. He was from Kentucky and he wanted to be a painter and he ended up being in the um, agricultural business. In fact, he's given credit for helped um, in Who's Who in America said he helped create the Federal Agricultural Marketing Act and the Federal Farm Board. So long detour comes at last. And instead of painting a picture on canvas, he paints it on already <clears throat> lovely countryside with friendly avenues and homes and people. And I love, you know, somebody along the line did give me his 1931 book on Witchwood, and the dedication was to quite a number of people and things, all good to live with or know, such as children, sunshine, fresh air, trees, and flowers, and folks who love them. So he was the creator of this wonderful community of Witchwood, and I, I read a lot of the ads, there were ads 
and the New York Herald and the magazines, and it was really promoted as this really up and coming, unique community of these beautiful homes that stretched across the spectrum of many different house styles. And this is the, these three homes, plus the fourth one was just built recently on one of the Bristol properties, were owned by the Bristol Myers family. And they lived there for many years. And 100 Golf Edge over there in the right hand corner is the one I've never been in. And I walked down that driveway very nervously and took that picture because I had only seen it from the street and all I ever saw were all the stone chimneys and I was really dying to get in there and see what it looked like. But his centerpiece, the Sit Manor House, Five Cherry Lane, this is one of the oldest, the second oldest house in New Jersey, if the other one's still standing, which is a, like a log cabin type house in South Jersey, but this is definitely the oldest house in New Jersey. And it was built in Jersey City in 1966. And, I mean 1666, but I'm sorry. Moved to Westfield in 1929, and it was, as Jersey City was building up, and there was kind of a, a log barricade around this house to protect it from all the encroaching commercialism in Jersey City at the time, and the people in Jersey City were trying to figure out how to save this house, which was such a fine house of a Dutch manor house, that they were going to move it to Liberty Park, and they couldn't figure out how to move it. And somehow Arthur Rule heard about it, and he wanted the old and which would as well as the new. So he hired um, somebody from New York, an architect and a, somebody who could take the house apart. They photographed it, they numbered all the pieces, they took that house apart and they moved it to Westfield in 1926 where it still stands today. It has been, be it has been beautifully loved and taken care of through the years with additions that are really fitting and complement the house and bring it up to today's standard for living in the, in the 21st century. It's really, really a lovely home and it's so nice to have it so well taken care of and loved. But one of my favorite stories, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, the Wendell family owned it when it was moved to Westfield and I had the opportunity to meet the son after his mother died selling the house who could walk us through the house and tell us a little bit of the history. And in that center chimney there, that was a very wide fireplace in the dining room. And at the end of that fireplace, in the passage, when you went from the dining room into the living room, there was a very deep, there was a china cabinet there. So that wall was very thick. So you're going from the dining room to the living room. And you see this wall that's about this thick. And he pulls out the china cabinet, and that's where the slaves hid during the war. The slaves So, another old house, he moved this one from the Ball Platt house, moved this one from Maplewood. It was built in 1746. I also read that he would go around and buy old mammals and columns and doors and trim from houses that were being torn down and have them incorporated in the houses that he was building in Witchwood. Fascinated by our little English, eclectic English country home up on Cherry Lane, but I can't find out any of the history on it. So I don't know anything about it. can't tell you anything about it other than it's just one of the fascinating different houses and then you've got many just beautiful Tudors, beautiful colonials showing the different airs of architecture. That's it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
the history on the house, on the big old brick house, and the Dorian and part of Dorian's hazel, and it was built in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I do. Um, yeah, Alessandra. Yeah. yeah. I, you know what? I have that on my, I have about 30 slides that we had time showing, and that was one of them. I mean, Sherry met with me, and we started going through it. We would be here all night, right? We yeah. love it, but, you know, we had to get another a lot. I series. Had another night. <laughs> I have a lot of before and after things, and I did a little run through at my office this morning to practice since I've never done anything like this before. And I asked them for feedback and they said, oh, they just love the before and after pictures. And I said, but I, because I had about 20 more slides and I can understand why a realtor would love that. <laughs> so I just, you know, I, I had to narrow it down, but that definitely was one that I wanted to research and talk about. That's a great house. Part two. Yeah. Part two. <laughs> I'm going to talk you into it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Wait, this kind of question. Oh, one more. Okay. I, I just, uh, in the beginning, you mentioned something about Sears houses. Yeah. Were, which of these were Sears houses? None of these no. were. I no, I couldn't get it. I had pictures of them, but we. Okay. Part two. I didn't even make it this in my timeline. And I looked at a lot of stuff about Witchwood, but that'll have to hopefully everybody knows a lot of the history. But I, I just want to so, so please look when you come to the library at some point, maybe January, uh, December, and you'll see the list of who's going to be speaking in 2019. We don't know yet. But we'll be working on that. So um, we'll have another four speakers next year. And we'd love to have anybody join us. Thank you so much. Hey, Barb. Barb, there's some pictures.